Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be your name, Lord. For our God is greater, and our God is stronger. Praise God, you are high. Him 
in our lives. And number four, to destroy you at all costs. And then what is his plan? His plan is threefold. Number one, he wants to deceive you in understanding what God has in store for you. Number two, he wants to divide you from God and his plan for you. And number three, ultimately, he wants to destroy any future with God that you may have. How does he do this? By getting us to focus on what? Me, myself, and I. Get it all focused on us and not on him. But remember, the closer you get to God, the more you set yourself apart for Him, the more intense the spiritual attacks on you will be. And even though I've said that, I've named them pretty much almost every week, I've dealt with this, but as I went with this, each and every week I named this too. Even though we, are, we have an enemy that is in a full-scale battle with us in this unseen spiritual realm, and he has influences all around us, in spite of all of that, What's, what's the thing we need to remember? God is in control. God is in control. He is in control. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that, that he's in control. Today, uh, we're going to look at our video here talking about the sword of the spirit. But as we get ready to go into it, let me just remind you that God has divine weapons at our disposal. God's given us these weapons. We have weapons that are capable of demolishing strongholds, weapons that can demolish anything that exalts itself in the knowledge of God. And hence with that, I want to introduce you this morning, the sword of the spirit with a little excerpt added to it. We don't have a gun problem in our nation. We have a Jesus problem. Amen. Yes. Amen. I should say we have a lack of Jesus problem. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm just saying that. The answer to what our nation is going through is found in one person, one person only. It's found in the Word of God. It's found in Jesus Christ. Like I said, we're dealing with today the sword of the Spirit. If we were, if we were to have every piece of armor we talked about up to this point, and we were to put it on, you would be capable of withstanding the devil's attacks in your life. In other words, everything we talk about so far gives you the ability to, to be able to withstand any attack that the devil brings against you. But here's the thing I want to get you to understand this morning. God desires more for us than to just withstand. He wants us to be able to send the devil running. See, God does not want you to be the devil's personal punching bag. Who's ever felt that way? That you, that you felt like you've been the personal punching bag of the devil, that he's just there clobbering you time after time again. God has not, it is not his desire. He has not called us or forgiven us to make us the devil's personal punching bag. And that is where this comes into place. See, every weapon we have discussed gets its strength and reliability from the Word of God. Again, going back to the beginning of this series, the Bible declared, we talked about this, what does it say? Your word, God's word is what? It is true. God's word is true. Jesus is what? Jesus is called the, the word. He was the word who became flesh. So, hence, Jesus is what? Jesus is true. If God's word is truth, and if Jesus is the word, then that means what? Jesus is true. Again, Everything in our relationship, everything in our God walk, everything in our Christian walk points back consistently to Jesus. It constantly points back to Him. See, a sword can be defensive. It can be a defensive weapon. But God has more than that plan for us. We have a weapon that can defeat our enemy. This thing that's called the sword of spirit will allow us to defeat our enemy. It's a weapon that the devil has no defense against. Satan must obey the Word of God. He has no choice in the matter. Whether he likes it or not, and again, the devil still has free will. But you need to understand something. God being God, God can declare something and it's going to happen. And here, here, let me sort of put out to you what I mean by that. God has put a law in effect called the law of gravity. Am I right? Who here thinks they can defy the law of gravity? You might be able to do it momentarily or for a very little bit, little bit of time, but the bottom line is that is a law that's always going to be in effect. What goes up must, must come down. 
I don't care if you get into outer space or whatever, the bottom line is, gravity is still a law of God that's in effect in outer space. Because our moon orbits around our, the planet Earth held in place by gravity. You know, it's the orbit held stable, but again, it's gravity, everything. There's the law of gravity, and it does not change. You cannot defy it. it it's there. There are laws. So whether, whether you like it or not, there are certain laws in place. And whether you want to obey them or not, it doesn't matter. They're in place and you're not going to change them. The same as the devil. There are certain things that God has in place no matter what he tries, no matter what he does, no matter what he says, he cannot go against it. He cannot change it. He cannot void it. He cannot make it uh, of ill effect or no effect at all because it is the word of God. Satan must obey the word of God. When he tried to overthrow heaven and God said, hey, stop. you're out of here. Guess what? Satan said, well, I'm not leaving. He had to leave. God's word, when God speaks something, it will take place. It will take place whether you do it in a form of obedience or whether you do it in a form of disobedience. You will either do it against your will or you will do it in your will. Or I should say with your will. Because God's word is eternal and it will do what it needs to do. But we have a weapon for this. In Mark chapter 1, verses 25 to 27, here's what we read. It says, Jesus cut him short. Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they asked excitedly. excitedly. It has such authority, even evil spirits obey his orders. See, Jesus here, he was showing he had power over what? Over demons, over evil spirits. See, the enemy must obey the word of God. Your offensive and defensive strength is not found in your clever words or thoughts. This might be something you want to write down this morning. Okay? Your offensive and defensive strength is not found in your clever words or thoughts. Let me, I'll say that one more time. Your Offensive and defensive strength is not found in your clever words or thoughts. It is found only. Listen to me closely. It is found only in the unchangeable, unshakable, unequal, unstoppable, eternal word of God. It is found only in the unchangeable, unshakable, unequal, unstoppable, eternal Word of God. The enemy must obey the Word of God. And if we want to stop the enemy in our life, that's what we need to use. And I'm going to show you through, throughout the message today. Jesus has given you his sword. Oh, he's, made, he's made him himself a sword for you. He's given you his sword. You have his authority. And you need to start using it in your life. Again, God does not want you. God does not desire for you to be the devil's personal punching bag. Here's what Jesus declared in Luke 10, verse 19. Look, I have given you authority over all. How much? All. How much? All. How much? All. all. The power of the enemy. Again, this is before his death and resurrection. And he's talked to the disciples. He says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Understand what he's laying at our disposal. Understand what he is giving us. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Jesus says here that we have his authority and we have his word. Let's start using it in our lives. Jesus doesn't just tell us about it, but He shows us 
how to fight with the sword of the Spirit in Matthew chapter 4. In this account, the devil tries to get Jesus to obey his words and commands instead of God the Father. I'm going to real quickly go through this this morning. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, this is what we read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I'm going to stop for one second. I'm going to pause you for a second. Who here? Now again, when I say wilderness, don't think the way... When we think of wilderness, what do we think of? No, when we no, when we we in America, usually we in America, when we think of the wilderness, what do we think of? We think of the woods. We think we think of Yosemite, Yellowstone. We think of all these these the, the, this lush green areas around us. When we think of the wilderness, we think of a place of peace and beauty. A place that can sustain. But in the Bible, when the Bible talks about wilderness, what does it talk about? You said it, what did you say? Sam? The desert. The desert. It talks about a, a desert type place. We have been in the wilderness of Judea, Juan and I have. And I want to tell you, pretty much all that's around are rocks. I mean, it, it, there, there, there's not grass. Uh, you might see what they call around like a Joshua tree, which is a shrub that may grow, maybe about that high, maybe, but, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's desolate, it's desolate, now, who here, who here would like to be in the wilderness that Jesus, when I describe that type of wilderness, who wants to be in that kind of wilderness, we don't, we don't like dry desert places, you know, some people move to like towards, you know, to the Phoenix, all that stuff, in the area of Arizona because of health reasons, still more drier climate, you know, but they still put water in to make it greener, but they still don't like the desert. But what does that verse tell us? Read the first part of it. Who took Jesus into the wilderness? Spirit. The Spirit did. The Spirit of God. Many times we don't like the wilderness. You know, sometimes that's exactly where the Spirit wants you to be. So I'm here to tell you, in the wilderness, the wilderness gets you to a place where you humble yourself before God and have to look at Him and let the bias of Him, where you have to be dependent upon Him. And there's no better place to be than when you're in a place where you're dependent upon God. See, man, we don't like to go through financial struggles. We don't like to go through relationship struggles. We don't like to go through this or that. But have you ever thought that maybe God is allowing this to happen to help you focus your eyes on Him? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For what intended purpose? to be tempted there by the devil. Now again, remember I told you, we know God does not tempt anyone. Because God can't be tempted. But, he, he led his own son into a place where his son could be tempted, not by God, but by who? Yeah. Alright, so let, let's just sort of get, let's get that out there. Okay, let's go. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. That would be, if I was to do that man, I'd look like a new person. You wouldn't recognize me. I'd be about the size of my pinky, you know. Let's go. All right. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by the very word that comes from the mouth of God. So here, we see the portion of Scripture, and then we see Satan's attack. Satan attacks. Turn these stones into bread. Obey me. Listen to what I'm telling you. What harm could there be in fulfilling the need of being hungry? You know, you're hungry. What's wrong with that? You know, you're the Son of God. If you're, just go ahead and do it. fulfill your need. Show you have the power. Just fulfill the need. But Jesus defends with the sword of the Spirit. He says, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, my true strength and nourishment comes from God. And here's what you understand. 
When, he's, when, when, I, when I read this here, the, this statement, when I was looking at this, and I said that my true strength and nourishment comes from God. When he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God, by, you know, by the words of God. Understand this. This is the same God who spoke everything into existence. So Jesus knew what he was saying when he says, I don't exist by bread alone, but I, I exist by the spoken word of God. Not only are we here because of his spoken word, but it's his spoken word that sustains us, that puts everything in place to make sure that everything grows, that everything has its time and its season, that the plants yield what they're supposed to yield, that the earth brings forth things that sustain us and supply us. See, it's not the bread that really sustains us. What is it? It is the word of God. So Jesus was letting Satan know he knows exactly who's in control here and who is that and where his strength and his hope is in. It is in God the Father in the spoken word of God. In verses 5 through 7 it says, And then the devil took him up to, to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, If you are the Son of God, jump off for the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you and he will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. See, Satan attacks, trying to use the scripture, trying to use the sword of the spirit. But of course, he always, as he does, he always takes everything out of context and he sort of twists a little bit. In other words, he makes it sound just true enough to try to fool you, but it, again, anytime. Now, now let, let me re-emphasize this today. If I haven't re-emphasized it enough during the series of messages, if I haven't emphasized it enough in almost the 10 years I've been here, everything, everything the devil says is what? Lie. Everything the devil says is what? To lie. To lie. It, 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 has, it has just enough truth in it. And it can have a lot of truth in it, but just enough falsehood to make it false. Because how true must something be to be true? 100%. If it's anything less than 100%, it's not true. Because the truth is always the truth in, in any situation, in any time, in any circumstance, for any person, for any reason. It is always the truth. Period. Period. But the devil is very good at, at making it sound just true enough. But there's always some falsehood behind it. He says, if you're the son of God, jump off for the scriptures say. Others, come on, sh sh show me, show me you, you, you're, you're the bitch. You know, this is what the Bible says. Because basically, you know, he, I bet he said, you, know, you use word against me, I'm going to use word against you. Because I guess he was trying to hope that since Jesus was, was in a physical form, that now Jesus was a little weaker than he was before, so he's going to try to slip him up. But he, he, he gets a rude awakening here. Jesus defends with the sword of the Spirit. He says the Scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. See, truly knowing the Scriptures, truly knowing the Bible, will aid greatly in keeping you out of trouble and false teachings. How many of you remember me making this statement? Too many Christians know just enough about the Bible to do what? Get themselves in to get trouble. Themselves in trouble. Because they don't truly get into the Word of God when someone comes around, it sounds like they're pretty similar to what they believe. All of a sudden, they, they, they can throw in, the, as Satan did, some words that aren't truly in the truth. That's why you've got to be careful. Again, I'm, I'm going to name a group here today. You need, well, I'm going to name two groups. You need to watch out for them. On the surface, they sort of maybe sound a little bit similar, but they are not. The Jehovah's Witness yep. and the Mormons. Yep. They, they do not read the same Bible we read. They do not believe the same way we believe. They do not, neither one of them believe that Jesus is the only begotten, truly, the truly only begotten Son of God who is a Savior for the world. And they do not believe that it's faith only in Jesus Christ. You need to run away. The problem, again, the, the problem is on the surface, a lot of their thoughts are very similar to ours. But there's something to be said about the details. Okay? 
So truly knowing the Scriptures will aid greatly in keeping you out of trouble and false teachings. Let me, let me ask you a question. How do you know I'm teaching you the truth if you don't read the Bible? I told you one of these days, and I will do it. I did it once before, and I'll do it again. I'm going to put something up there that's false. And see, see if I can get an amen out of it. Then I'm going to tell you. You better know your word. Because you need, to, you need to know the word. Just don't leave before I tell you that, or else you're going to leave the place thinking something wrong. Well, that's different. <laughs> The pastor said, and I'll say, Steve, roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> then in verses 8 through 10, we, we continue to read. It says, Next the devil took him up to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give all this to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the Scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. See, Satan attacks. He basically says, I will give you anything and everything if you obey me. Does that sound familiar? That's like a promise you would utter. Jesus again defends with the sword of the Spirit. Get out of here, Satan, he told him. For the Scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. Him. We see here that Jesus defended himself against three attacks of the devil. The devil even tried to use the word against Jesus, but anyone who reads the word and studies it, filling their head with it and wearing the complete armor of God will be able to withstand the attacks of the devil. Not just withstand, but using the sword of the Spirit against him until he flees. In other words, we don't have to be his what? Personal punching bag. We can use the Word of God not only to just stand firm, but to literally send Him packing and running. To send Him battered and bruised. And it says in verse 11, that the devil went away and angels came and took care of him. Now, I'll tell you, if there's a verse you may want to highlight, that might be one of them because this is something you need to sort of put back in your head. You need to say, it's showing you the promise that if you resist the devil, immediately, when you stand your ground and you force him to lead by the word of God, what's going to happen next? God's going to come and minister to you. There's going to be a refreshing at the end of that battle. There's going to be a time of communion and fellowship with the Most High because here the angels came down and took care of Jesus. But how long would a Satan have continued to attack if Jesus did not use the sword of the Spirit against him? How long would he continue to attack? First off, we don't know because Jesus did use the sword. But I guess honestly, yes, we do know because let's make it personal for this morning. How, how, how long does the devil continue to attack when you refuse to use the sword of the Spirit against him? But you refuse to use God's word against him. Then you begin to listen to his lies and begin to set them as truth and says, stand upon what the word of God says. When you can stand upon his word of God and find your freedom and cause the devil to flee by standing firm on the word of God and taking it and using it to beat the snot out of the devil. Literally, take your Bible, take the sword of the Spirit, and bludgeon him to death. Your strength and victory rest in the Word of God. It rests in Jesus who is the Word. So how do we take the sword of the Spirit? We take the sword of the Spirit by picking up the Word of God, in other words, the Bible, and reading it, studying it, filling our mind and our heart with it, meditating on it. Thinking about it. Letting it become a part of our lives. Let me ask you a question. Where, did, where does a soldier keep his sword? He keeps it inside in a sheath. Where do you keep your sword? Or where should you keep the sword of the Spirit? You should keep the sword where? In your heart. 
In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, this is what Jesus says. He says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is within your heart. From what is in your heart. Who you really are will come out. You may be able to fool some of the people some of the time, all the people some of the time. But you can never fool God. Sure. And eventually, if you're putting up the mask in the front, it's going to eventually come out. Mm -hmm. If your heart is filled with the good of the word, it will overflow that your mouth will speak good things. See, it's just going to be a natural thing. Because the closer you get to God, the more you're going to become like Him, the more He's just going to flow out of you. How do you have an overflow in the word of the Word in your heart if you don't continually fill it? I don't want to see a show of hands. Because I'm afraid to see what the show of hands would be. But how many of you truly, honestly, pick up the Word of God each day? or on a regular basis, or at least four times a week. See, that way it could be every other day. Three times a week. Twice a week. Once a week. And we wonder why we're a punching bag. We wonder why we struggle with this and that. And that. Again, this is not, understand this morning, I am not here to beat you up. I'm here to train you. I'm here to educate you. I'm here to help you know if you want to overcome the devil, if you want to get to a place where not just having your arm around the constant can take attacks, but to where instead of just taking the attack, you can now turn it around and kick his rear end. It's all found, all this armor is based in the Word of God. And the thing that's going to, the offensive weapon that's going to take him down, that's going to make him flee, is the Word of God. We need to start speaking the Word of God against the enemy. When the devil comes in and starts to put things in your mind, start to speak the Word of God against him. Realize this is not a thought that God has for me. God has a plan for me. He loves me. He has a future and a hope for me. It's not for my ruin, it's not for my disaster, but it's for my future and for my hope. And I'm standing upon who God says I am, not who you say I am. Right. See, there's times we need to fight back with the Word of God and tell the devil he is a liar. If you take just enough to get you through the day or the week like some do with church, how can you ever have an overflow coming out of your mouth? We need daily bread to fill our hearts until they overflow with the good of the Word of God. Because here's what Paul, well, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. What is the Word of God? It is alive and powerful. Isn't it amazing if you've been serving God at any time and, and you pick up the Bible and, and, and it's like one of sort of sharing like, like with a song and sometimes they get a different view on that but even the Word of God as you begin to read it and all of a sudden as you're going through a different season in your life the way you saw it at one point in your life you now can see it completely different like wow. Why did I ever see that before? See, it's the more you read it, the more He reveals Himself, the more He makes known to you. And I'm here to tell you, if you, if you are ever bored reading the Word of God, it's you, it's not Him. Because God being God, there, there, there's no understanding of His limits. There's no understanding the completeness of who He is. So there's always something He is ready to reveal to those who are honestly seeking and searching. If you ever get bored in your relationship with God, it's not God's fault. You stopped for some reason. If you ever get bored in your marital relationship, 
It's not just your spouse's fault. It's your fault too. I know it takes two to tango. But many times, instead of pointing fingers to others, we start looking at ourselves and saying, Lord, change me. Oh, see, many times we want to say, Lord, change this person. No. As, as an old song by Michael Jackson saying, start with the man in the mirror. Little did, did, did this guy know that he was speaking some biblical truth when he said that. Lord, change me. Adjust my attitude. Adjust my way of thinking. Help me to become, become the person I should be. See, and in you changing, you never know. That will affect. Honestly, it will affect the other person. And if both of you are praying in, oh, what a harmonious marriage. What a harmonious relationship. That will be. Not praying to change the other person, but for yourself to change. Let God be God. Let God take care of you. Let God take care of the other person. By all means, pray for them. But pray for them and say, Lord, bless them. Let your anointing be upon them. Not change them to what you think. Lord, bless them. Let your anointing be upon them. Use them mightily for your kingdom. Let your will be done in their life. Not my will. Your will be done. See, there, there's a difference there. But the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And I will tell you, that's the number one reason why most people, if they want to try to straddle the fence in a relationship with Jesus Christ, does not, they do not read the Word of God. Because it gets to the heart of the matter. You're confronted with, this is what I say, this is what you think. Which, which one are you going to follow? God's saying, this is what I say, this is what you think. You notice what I'm doing here. I'm not saying, this is what I say, this is what you think. This is what I say, this is what you think. So what am I saying? There is, are they close? Or what? They're separated. There's a distance between them. This is what I say. This is what you think. Which one are you going to do? Because it will never... The Word of God is alive and powerful. See, He's given this to us to where we can truly defeat the enemy. He's, he showed us to just stand upon the Word. We've got to know the Word to stand upon the Word. I'm here to tell you, God has given us this armor not to just stand there and be bludgeoned like crazy and still be standing there saying, well, at least I made it through. No, man, I want to be victorious in this thing. I want to be able to actually put the devil under my foot, put it on his head and say, in Jesus' name, you're a loser and a dirt ball, and I'm not going to listen to you. Because again, it's not me doing it, but it's him. And this is what he makes available through this thing called the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. He's given us everything we need not to just withstand, but to vanquish, to make the devil run and flee. And it's all available with this last piece of offensive armor, armor, this weapon called the sword of the Spirit. I'm going to Next week, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with something else. But then I'm going to come back in because there's, there's something we need to bring into this. Because this, the sword of the Spirit, is probably one of the most, it's one of the most powerful of them, but it's not the only weapon that He gives us for offense. And we're going to dive into them in two weeks. What that is. So what do we need to do to deal with and defeat the attack of the enemy? Before we get out of bed each morning, what do we need to do? Put on the armor of God. What is this armor? It's the belt of truth. It's the, the body armor, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, a piece of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. And I will say after all, all those videos so far have been up to date. If you missed any of these, I'm going to tell you, go to our YouTube page, our video page. It is on there. But we need the armor of God. And I told you this too as we talked about this. The armor does not keep Satan away. 
It does not keep Satan away. What protects us when you are protected. But with the sword of the Spirit in our hand, we can do more than just withstand the attack. We can go to the offensive and do some hurting ourselves. Put in a couple lashes and slashes ourselves. So in closing, what do we need to do? We need to prepare for the attack. And how do we do this? We do this, number one, by memorize, to mem by memorizing scripture in your area of weakness. I I've told you this each and every week. And I hope you're doing this. I hope you're looking at God's Word. And, and as you come across scriptures that speak to your life, whether it's a season that you're going through right now, write them down. Memorize them. Place them in the areas you place them in the mirror in your bathroom. Place them on your mantle in your living room, all above your fireplace. Have them in your phone. Because that will just prepare you. Because again, it's about filling our lives, filling our heart with the good of the Word of God. So memorize Scripture in your area of Number two, read the Word of God daily. It is our daily bread. Meditate upon it. Because again, Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not what? That I might not what? That I might not what? Sin. Sin. Not sin against you. The Word. Do you begin to see, as we talk about this, how we begin to deal with this, how powerful the Word of God is and what it can do in your life, the type of freedom and deliverance it can bring. And what I'm, what I'm telling you, it's not easy. It is work. It, 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 it takes time. It takes time to sit down and, 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 and set time aside to meet with God, to read His Word. It takes time to do that. But what He offers is so much more worth than what we do in the time we get. So I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In Psalms 34, 15 through 19, again, it says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to the cries for help. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. But the you remember, the Lord hears His people when they call to Him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the broken heart. He rescues them rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to your rescue each time. You know, so you've been hearing these verses each and every week, and I just hope and pray that somehow, somewhere, they are truly getting into your head, getting into your heart. So we need to memorize Scripture, we need to read the Bible daily, and meditate upon it, and number three, we need to cry out to God in time of need. His ears open to us, folks. His ears open. We need to cry out, God, deliver me, defend me, protect me, strengthen me, help me overcome this attack. And here's the thing, you know, sometimes, and I know we need to cry out to Him to do that, but we need to understand that He has given us everything we need to do that. What this does is remind us the strength is not in ourselves. The strength is in Him. The strength is in Him. We find our strength in Him. We need the armor of God. So today, as we begin to end our time together, and, that, and I'll let the musicians begin to come and take uh, their place. As we want to end this thing here, we're going to read and pray over ourselves. The prayer, this, this final part of this uh, this actual thing here. But there's another part we need to throw on this. There's another part of this prayer. We're not going to do it today. We're going to do it in two weeks. But, but read this with me. And let's pray on the sword of the Spirit. Finally, I take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I pray this offensive weapon into my hand and ask that your Word would be fitting for every encounter I face. As the enemy gets close to me, please give me the insight, wisdom, and skill to will the Word of God spoken in season and out of season to inflict pain against the enemy. What's it used for? I love how this prayer says it. To inflict pain against the enemy. 
May the enemy and his team flee from me upon hearing the word of God spoken by the power and direction of the Holy Spirit. Give me the sword of the Spirit to cut through the wiles of the devil so that I may discern the schemes of the enemy when he is near. Oh, I, but I love this, this, this one here. May the enemy and his team flee from me upon, upon hearing the word of God spoken by the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to say, you're not in this battle alone. God has given you everything you need Amen. to be victorious. The question is, the question is, will you pick it up, will you do, and take what he has out there for you to do, and stand in it and speak it the way he tells you to speak it? Oh, man, I'm telling you. Yes? What is, could you explain briefly in season, season out of season? There's times when it's convenient and times when it's not. Others, there's times when we know when we know that we're truly walking and there may be times we're saying, God, what's going on? Others where we have, we have the wherewithal, we have the discernment to understand what's going on. Because there's, there's, there's times, it, it, there's, again, there's going to be times when it's convenient, there's going to be times when it's not convenient. Well, well to, to, to use the Word of God. Others, to speak out in the Word. Okay? But God has given us everything we need not to just withstand. <laughs> and I love it. Not to just withstand. But to have overwhelming victory, the Word tells us, to have overwhelming victory through the one who loves us. To have overwhelming victory. We have overwhelming victory through Jesus Christ. And if we would just truly use the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, who is Jesus Christ. And we just begin to just blood to the devil. When the devil says something, say, yeah, but Jesus said, Jesus declared, I am loved. I am a child of God. And I, and he is pleased with me. I am forgiven. I am changed. I am restored. Oh, I'm telling you, begin, you begin to begin to speak these words over your life. When the enemy comes in, yes. you begin to declare. Declare to him and declare to yourself. Begin to stir up that within you. See, and if your faith comes up, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah. It'll increase your faith and plus make the devil run at the same time. You can see how all of these things are interdependent. We can be victorious. We will be victorious if we do it the way that God has it laid out. But again, it's up to you. It's up to you to put it on. It's up to you to begin to clothe yourself in this. He's not going to make you do it. It's up to you. It's all found in this one name, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Will you stand for this one? Maybe two different types of songs in the service with this morning. But it all deals with the sword of the spirit. What is the sword of the spirit? It is what? The word of God. Who is the word? Jesus. Jesus. And there is no other name. He as this as this song says that there is no other name. It says, when it goes into the bridge, it says, Your name, O Lord, is the tower into which we run. Time of distress, you give us power to make us overcome. You give us power to make us overcome. By your name, the name of the Lord. By the name of who? Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. What is the Word? The Word of God is true. Tired of being a puncher back in the devil. Right, amen. Who, who wants to say, Lord, I want to be more than a puncher back? I want to be towards this. I want to say, Lord, well, this message is from you today. I'm here to tell you that's what he tells you. We can do the word of God, but you have to pick it up. You have to make it a part of your life. You realize it's more, it's just diving deeper into this and diving, diving deeper into your relationship with Jesus. It all revolves around him. And as we sing this song, if you would, just as an again, if you want to sit there, you can. But I'm just actually, as, as, a, as a step of faith, as an out.
outward sign to the enemy. Devil, you know what? I believe what Pastor's saying here today is through the word of God, I'm going to find my deliverance, not only my deliverance, my victory, not only my victory, I'm going to send you back. I'm going to send you running. And when you get to rear your ugly head again, I'm going to pull out the word of God again and beat you over to heaven with it again. When you pull your head out again, I'm going to beat you over to heaven again. I'm going to play whack a ball with you. I know whack a ball is. Then Chuck and Cheese will always pop their heads up and think they're boom! Boom! Let's play whack a ball on the devil's head. And what you do with the word of God. Amen? But it's all found in Jesus Christ. And if you want to just make that declaration today, I want to encourage you to slip up where you are as we see this.